John chapter 4, fourth chapter of John's Gospel. Yeah, I'm going to be here at 5 o'clock this evening for a, a Bible study and a time of prayer. So come on at 5 if you're not already at a, a Sunday school class party. And um, I'll get you home by halftime, okay? I got a big ticket um, sermon this morning, big ticket item that I um, want to share with you here titled Jesus a Jew. I've got a reason for that title, Jesus as a Jew. I want to say, first of all, I want to express uh, deep gratitude to Susan Meeks and the ladies that helped Susan at Ted and Val's home yesterday. Uh, a lot of y'all are aware of what's going on. It was, it was such a great thing this past week when Miss Allison, Louise Allison from PATH Partners Against Trafficking Humans, when she called me and said, uh, you remember Val and she's one of our PATH survivors and they need some help right now. Can Cedar Heights help? And I said, sure, I'll call Susan. Amen? Thank you, Susan. Uh, just a, a great hand. And y'all keep Ted and Val in your prayers and God's doing a, a great work. Uh, there and again I want to say thank you to Cedar Heights for being the kind of church that I can have full confidence that when those kind of situations come up Cedar Heights is going to stand up and be counted okay um, thank you my hat's off to you Cedar Heights thank you again Susan for all that you're doing Jesus as a Jew there's a lot of history in this Jewish thing, amen? It, it's, it's in the news a lot to this very day. And the Bible has a good bit to say about it. And I want us to really be prayerful and thinking about it because we have some... Uh, the point of the message today really impacts us in the church today. It impacts us at Cedar Heights Baptist Church. So, so it impacts us in the church general, but it also has a deep impact for us as a church local. So there are some issues in our church and our own attitude and our own understanding that we really need to work on, all right? So th this isn't going to be like a negative thing, but it is going to be a point where we need to work on some change. And we all know how change goes in a Baptist church, amen? Amen? It's like when you say the word change, it's like change. Is that in the dictionary? You know, Jesus was a change agent. He came, he started, he started shaking all kinds of stuff up. Matter of fact, it's one reason why he was really hated and despised by his own people. Because he came insisting on change. Some change in some areas that they were pretty... Um, <laughs> they had embraced some things that were not godly at all and he started challenging that uh, you know I kind of like a challenge don't you like a challenge do you like everything I mean who wants to live a whole hum hum drum life you want to live a whole hum hum drum life you want to be a whole hum hum drum Christian? If you do, you be, need to go to some other church because we ain't it. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. And we don't want to be it. Amen? Stand up with me. Let's start at verse number one. When I get through reading, we'll pray. John chapter 4 verse 1 when Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John though Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were he left Judea and went again to Galilee he had to travel through Samaria so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, 
Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, you, a Jew, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God, and who is saying, do you give me a drink? You would ask him and he'd give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? Then it goes on, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you again for your great salvation provided through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this encounter, this interaction between our Lord and this lady. And we pray that just the, the issues that were being addressed here in this account, this incident, Help us relate to it. Help us to understand better than ever the way some of the truths here apply to us today. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, the Samaritans, uh, the Samaritans, in case you don't know, the Samaritans were a bunch of folks that were really disliked by the Jews. And the problem was is they lived in close proximity one to another. The Samaritans, you know, uh, the Jews into Babylon, the Babylonian captivity, we call it. And they spent about 70 years over there in captivity in Babylon, Iraq, current day Iraq, that area. And they, they kind of took the aristocratic upper crust of the Jewish people in the captivity. They took the upper crust, the businessmen, things like that, those with money, finances, and stuff, and they kind of left, you know, the common Jewish people back in Palestine. Oh, they did destroy the temple and all, all that as well. But they left the common folk back in Palestine. So during this 80-some years that they're over there in captivity in um, Babylon, the common folk, common Jewish folk that they left behind <coughs> started um, intermarrying, intermarrying with non-Jewish people. All right? That's the stock of the Samaritans. So do the Jews, when they come back from captivity, when they come back to Palestine, when they come back to Israel, they really, I mean, the idea that the Jews were the chosen people of God had, it, if you will, not that they weren't, but it kind of went to their head, <laughs> you know. It kind of went to their head that they were, the, they were the chosen of God, they were the select, and God intended that the fact that, he was, that they were the chosen people was supposed to be a blessing to all the other nations, but instead of them becoming a blessing to all the other nations, they kind of took it as a point of privilege over all other nations. And instead of being a blessing to all other nations, they secluded themselves, excluded themselves from other nations to the point like these Samaritan folks, they despised them. They had laws. They wrote laws that regulated, um, I say regulated, that said they couldn't inter even interact with them. I mean, one law was so onerous, they actually had a law that if a Jewish man was walking down a trail, a pathway, and he came upon a, a Jewish lady in labor, I mean, a Samaritan woman in labor about, you know, having difficulty giving birth to a child, he was forbidden by law to help her because it would be better for her and the child to die than another Samaritan be brought in the world. That was the law, okay? I, we would look at that as being kind of onerous, kind of uh, exclusive, kind of, sort of kind of evil even, wouldn't we? 
I mean, how hard-hearted would you be to be come, up, come upon somebody that's in the thresh, thr thrashing around with life itself and to say, uh, it'd be better to, for me just to let you die than to help you. Uh, if a Jewish man happened to be walking down a path and a, a Samaritan or a man, Samaritan man or woman, came walking by them, uh, they could not even make eye contact. They were not supposed to make eye contact. They were to have no interaction with them. As a matter of fact, the Jewish man preferred to walk across the street to the other side of the street so that he, you know, so that he might not accidentally brush up against the Samaritan. They were considered unclean. If you, were to, if you were a Jewish person and if you ran into a Samaritan by chance, if you even touched them, you were considered ceremonially unclean so that you could not go to the temple to worship God and you would have to go through seven days of ceremonial cleansing of yourself, washings and baptisms and all kind of stuff before you could even go worship God. That was how much they despised in particularly the Samaritan people. It's, my, it's kind of what we would, we have a particular phrase we would use. They were half-breeds. They were half-breeds. Now we have Jesus. <laughs> the other disciples have gone into town to get some food and we have Jesus walking up to this well and here's this Samaritan woman come into the well and not only is she a Samaritan woman but she's really not accepted by her own folks amen she's alone and the women didn't go to the well alone not respectable women they went in groups amen so this woman she's um she's rejected or she's shunned even by her own people and we find out a little bit later why because she's a woman of quite ill repute she's been married and divorced five times and she's shacking up with a guy at the moment. The woman at the well. She's alone. Jesus is alone. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan and one of ill repute among her own folks. And Jesus has the audacity to look at this unclean, despicable woman and ask her, for a drink. She's shocked. I mean, it would be hard to put the right kind of emphasis on her question there. You're, you're me? She is, in the vernacular of our day, it blew her away that he would even talk to her. And not only that, not only did he talk to her, you know, he wanted to drink from her cup, bucket. This is, I mean, this is, you talk about breaking tradition. You talk, of, you talk about somebody that's um, attacking barriers. It would be hard for me to describe the kind of wall that Jesus Christ is tearing down here. Uh, culture in our culture it'd be hard for me to <coughs> emphasize the drama okay the drama that's going on here um, it worked <laughs> it worked um, not only does Jesus have a, you can read the rest of the story there in the he goes uh, he accepts her um, he gets invited to her town. He goes to her town. He, he preaches the truth to all of the people there in Sychar in her hometown. And almost the whole town is converted, believes that he's the Messiah. It's really a, a wonderful story. And it freaks the disciples out when they show up, you know. And they, I mean, their eyes are wide open. He's talking to this Samaritan woman. What is wrong with Jesus? Uh, you know, he was freaking his own followers out. And he was really, that's one reason why the Jews hated him. The Jewish leaders, the aristocracy, the Pharisees, the, those guys. He was shaking up their little world. And you know what? He might just shake up our little world, folks. I got a couple of points here. The first point is this. Uh, Jesus here is crossing, tearing down the racial 
divide. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Not just Jesus, but it, it happens in the church, the early church. <coughs> Verses 11 through 14. I want to emphasize this for a minute about the racial divide. Jesus is tearing down. A ra I've tried to describe the racial conflict between Jews and non-Jews. Amen. And it wasn't just the Samaritan. It was anyone that wasn't a Jew was a Gentile. And the Jews had a real problem. And the early church had a real problem with this barrier, with this divide. Verse number 11, in the, in the church at Galatia. When Cephas, and that's a reference to Peter, came to Antioch, Paul writing, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And what did the apostle Peter stand condemned for? His racial prejudice is what it was. Verse 12. For he used to eat with the Gentiles, okay, the non-Jews. He used to eat with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. <laughs> James, one of the apostles, right? However, when they came, when these Jewish folks come, I mean, he's sitting there, you know, as long as he's kind of by himself and his old buddy, his old religious buddies aren't with him, he's quite comfortable eating with the, the non-Jews in the church there at Galatia. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. In other words, even in the church, there was... Um, there were different parties, factions within the church. Some of them, the circumcision party, that, those were the, there was a certain faction inside the church that said only Jews could actually be saved. Gentiles could not even be saved. That was the, you had to be of the circumcision party, okay? 13, then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy. It's contagious, Amen. Joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas, Barnabas, Barnabas that went around with Paul preaching the good news of Christ, even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, let me tell you, the gospel is inclusive. Better get this, church. We better get this. Uh, this is, I'm not preaching with a pointed finger. It's a we thing, okay? We need to get this. When I saw that they were uh, deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas, Peter, in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? And he goes on, basically what he does is he stands up in front of the whole church and looks at Peter and says, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. We're talking a racial divide here. We're talking a racial divide. I want to talk to you just a little bit about this thing about division. Go back to the book of Genesis. Would you go back to Genesis? Um, verse, chapter 11, Genesis 11, first of all. You know, the Bible, the Bible's really an amazing book. It's got, it's got a lot of truth in it. If you don't know what you're seeing, you might not see what's actually there. Here in chapter 11, starting verse number 1, is where we have the Tower of Babel thing. All right? Verse number 1, at, the, uh, at one time the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. And as people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Sinar and settled there. They said to each other, come let us make oven-fired bricks. They had brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. They were pretty sharp. They knew about asphalt and all that kind of stuff way back yonder. Four. And they said, here we go. Look at this. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Let's make a name. We're not going to be divided. The only problem was God shows up. And God says, oh, you got this, you're making this big boast. You're not going to be divided? <laughs> I think you're forgetting someone. 
And so what does God do? He confuses their language and he scatters them out over the face of the whole earth. You know, at this time, a lot of people don't understand this, that when this happens, the earth is one. There's one landmass. How many of y'all are taught in school this uh, unique, wonderful thing called continental drift? Anybody remember continental drift? Raise your hand if, you, if you've heard of that, continental drift. It's a good subject in school, right? I mean, you can, put the con you can slide all the continents back together and they fit nicely together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. South America slides right over into Africa and North America slides over into Europe and all that, and it makes one nice little solid ground. Did you know that's biblical? And the Bible tells us all about continental drift. Did you know that? Y'all are looking at me like, Chuck, you're nuts. I love this. <clears throat> so look in chapter 10. Back here, here, we're still in Genesis. Now chapter 10 covers a pretty good span of time. When the Tower of Babel happens, there's one land <clears throat> surrounded by an ocean. God scatters them out over the face of the earth. And in chapter 10, we have uh, gene genealogy being given to us that spans way past the Tower of Babel thing, past the flood of Genesis chapter 6. The floods happened, you know, and all that. Look at verse 24, 10:24. 24. Erzfax had fathered Selah, and Selah fathered Eber. Eber, Eber had two sons, one was named Peleg, look at this, one was named Peleg, for during his days the earth was divided. Okay, Peleg, that name comes from the Hebrew verb Peleg, and that verb means to split apart, to cleave asunder. <clears throat> so what happens is the flood comes, and when the flood came, the earth was one landmass. It wasn't continents. It was one landmass. And then after that, several hundred years later, the whole Tower of Babel thing happens. And then after God scatters them over the face of the earth, <coughs> several hundred years, Peleg is born after that. And during the life of Peleg, continental drift took place. God split the earth apart. It's right there in the Word of God. God split the earth apart and he formed the continents. And it was during that time that the great mountain ranges were shoved up like 27,000 foot peaks was formed as, with this shove. I'm not saying it all happened in a day. It was during the lifetime of Peleg. <coughs> the continents were split apart. Great giant mountain ranges were um, formed. I want to ask you a question. How many of y'all put gasoline in your car this last week? You know, every time you put gas in your car, you're proving that this is true. Do you know some of that oil, some of the petroleum product that you get, do you know that, that there are oceans of oil, oceans of oil that are five miles under the surface of the earth? How do you think an ocean of oil got five miles under the surface of the earth? Let me tell you what, when a tree falls here today, when a tree falls, it doesn't form petroleum. It just rots. All of these oceans of oil that are buried under the earth, I mean, they were forests. It was a cataclysmic event that formed all the petroleum products of this planet. Uh, have you been over to West Virginia, a place over there, and you see the mountains where they're taking the coal out of... The, how do you think those forests and, were suddenly compressed to make entire layers of coal under strata of the earth? It doesn't happen with the day-to-day -day event of trees falling down and rotting on the ground. It had to be cataclysm, cataclysmic -y, <laughs> however you say, covered. You, you know when this takes place? During the days of Peleg. As the earth is split apart. There are, I mean, geologists tell us 
There are places where entire strata of earth are flipped over upside down. That doesn't happen over millions of years through gradual erosion. And that happens through cataclysm. It happened during the days of Peleg. You know why? Because God said to this proud, boastful humanity, Oh, you think you're not going to be divided? Um, I'll not only confuse your language and scatter you over the earth, but then I'm going to split the cotton pick and earth apart, and the seas are going to be... Every time you look at a sea, when you look at the continents, what you're seeing is division that God caused where God said, you think you can stay united apart from me? You're crazy. Like when you look in New York City at the um, United Nations building. It's kind of like another Tower of Babel. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to stay united. Uh, how's that working out for us? This United Nations that's been around for what? 60, 70, 80 years, something like that. Um, have have y'all heard of any wars or strife in the world today? I want to tell you something. There's more spread out wars and strife and stuff in the world today collectively over the whole earth than ever before in human history. You know why? Because man will not boast and say we can stay united. God says no, got a problem. You're not going to do it apart from me. Now this is where Jesus jumps right in the middle and what we need to know in the church is it's not going to be a law it's a church. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings together only Jesus. Only Jesus. Whether it's racial or maybe it's social. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. And this isn't just the racial deal here. This is just social standing, status. Okay? Verse 17. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Now I'm giving the following instruction. I do not praise you. In other words, this is rebuke. I don't praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, this church was coming together and it didn't help anything. It was hurting what God was up to. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, among you so that the approved, the approved among you may be recognized. <laughs> Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper for an eating. Each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One person's hungry while another gets drunk. You know it's a Baptist church, amen? In other words, what's going on here, this is, this is inside the church. There were divisions in the church according to social status and standing. In other words, if you didn't, if you didn't measure up to a certain uh, economic plateau, you weren't part of that class. You weren't part of that group. Not only were you not part, you weren't welcome. They had to be, and I'm not even talking about belief, you know, doctrines. I'm talking about social status. So they had racial conflict. They had social status conflict. And you know what? Even though we may not think about it a whole lot, we have a lot of that today in our church. A lot of that today. And we make excuses for it. We live in a real exciting time. We live in a perfect time for God to overcome these things in our life, in our day, and in our time. It's exciting. I mean, in my short life, <laughs> did you, short life? Let me tell you a little bit of what I've seen. When I went to the first grade, I went to the first grade in 1957 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Bell Point Elementary School. I went to the first grade. Do you know in Fort Smith, Arkansas, when I went to the first grade in 1957, was the first time in the history of Fort Smith, Arkansas that a black kid went to the white school. His name was Charles Nichols. 
I mean, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, there was white schools and there were black schools. All right? In Fort Smith, Arkansas, there were white neighborhoods and then there were the black projects. I was fortunate enough, I lived a, black, a, a block and a half from the black projects. And because I lived only a block and a half from the black projects, I really didn't know there was a difference between white and black folk because we played together. But that, a, a law, I don't know how it came about, but Charles Nichols, the little black kid, was put into my class and, and Fort Smith had the idea on integration. They were going to do it gradually. Okay? It wasn't going to be one big thing. We were going to gradually merge together. And so the first black child in Fort Smith that went to a white school was in my first grade class and he was a friend of mine. And he went all the way through and then I was back there in the sixth grade and we were in the sixth grade together and then when I went to Darby Junior High School when I went in the seventh grade he was the first black kid that went to junior high school. It was going to be a great... And then, you know, with the years behind us there were more and more you know, bringing together. I lived that in my lifetime. Most of y'all, fortunately, can't even imagine that kind of thing. But that's in my lifetime. We've seen this. Now then, that's kind of a, there's been a racial divide in this country. Amen? Been a racial divide. If you don't think there's been a racial divide in this country, just look around this room right now. How white is this congregation. And we make all kinds of excuses. Well, we just, we have, we, we have different worship styles. Amen, Tina? We have different worship styles. Bla yeah, yeah, they do too. Blacks do too. You know. Hey, you know what? To have black churches over here and white churches over here is a dishonor to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a dishonor. That's what Paul's saying to the church. You dishonor the gospel of Christ. And we can make all of the comfortable little excuses we want to make, but they don't stand up before the throne of God. In other words, I want to challenge us this morning. We need to be intentional to tear down these barriers. Let the walls come down. And one thing I know about walls, these kind of walls, they don't fall by accident. They fall when the people of God make a decision, by the grace of God, we're tearing down that wall. We all help, we all get focused, and let's tear down this wall. If we want to honor the blood of Jesus Christ, we need to tear it down. We need to be intentional. In other words, here's what I mean. You got a black friend, invite, invite him to church. That's, a sim that's as simple as that. You got somebody that's a little maybe a higher social status or maybe a lower social status. You know, you hear about the churches. I mean, I just, it makes me shudder when somebody asks me, what kind of church do you have? And I have to say, it's a blue-collar church. What am I saying when I say Cedar Heights is a blue-collar church? It means we're kind of all in the same social strata. And you know what? That's a dishonor to the gospel of Jesus Christ. See what I'm saying? You know somebody on the down and out, invite them to church. Invite them to your house to ha you know, share a meal. You know somebody that's way up there <laughs> at the top of the strata ladder, don't invite them to church. We, we, ought, to be a, we, ought, we ought to be a hodgepodge of humanity at Cedar Heights. I mean, they taught it to us as kids. Red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in his sight. Jesus loves little children of the world. Amen? 
Revelation, turn to Revelation. Chapter 7. This is just kind of the exclamation point, okay? In case you hadn't gotten the idea, whatever, wherever you are in your life, I want to tell you something. Jesus died for you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Verse number 9. You have the 144,000 there, verses 4 through 8, you know, 12,000 from the 12 tribes. And then look at verse 9. After this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Red, yellow, black, and white. Red, yellow, black, and white. Red, yellow, black, and white. Amen. That's the kingdom of God. I want us to bow for a word of prayer. Oh, and the world's pretty smart. You know what? One of the great things that Satan is using now to divide us, he's using politics. For some reason, when I say the word politic, it makes me want to spit. And with this stiff upper lick up, lip, I've got to kind of do it accidentally anyway. You think that politics should divide the church of God? God forbid. God has it set up. Here's the answer. There's only one thing that brings us together. And that's Jesus Christ. And the other side of that coin is Jesus Christ ought to bring us together. Amen? And if you're not a believer, there's only one way to enter into God's kingdom, and that's through the blood of Jesus. Father, we come before you this morning in the name and through the blood of Jesus. We thank you for your love for us and... Um, God, help us to see. Help us to see whatever walls that have been built that we need to intentionally go to work tearing them down for the sake of your reputation in this world. So that, in fact, the church of the living God does not look like the rest of the world. Help us to be the church that Jesus died for. Help us to live the kind of life that Jesus lived for your honor and for your name. Let's stand up. Jennifer, you lead us.
This will make a little more sense to you now. Revelation 21, the new heaven and new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea existed no longer. You see, there's no more division in the new heaven and the new earth. It's in Revelation 21. 